Hello, fantastic third graders, and welcome to another wonderful, likely exciting video about Rome. Today, we're going to learn all about the Roman Republic. We're going to learn about how Rome went from a kingdom to a republic and how, where all those people, uh, what they all did, the order and classes of all those people, and some fun inf information about Roman government. So here we go. Before the Republic, things that we had talked about earlier, there was a king, King Romulus, and every king after that was elected by the people to please the people. Uh, the Roman kingdom lasted for about 100 years, about, and many of the kings were inspired by the Etruscans, which was an empire north of Rome. Now, inspired by is, is a loose term. A lot of the kings were actually from the Etruscan Empire. And although the kings were elected, they really weren't elected fairly. Uh, they were elected to please the people. So the people that had lots of money, uh, the people who had lots of land, those sorts of people were the people that were uh, getting to know and, and electing certain kings or certain kings would give those people benefits and therefore, uh, you know, basically find ways to, to pay off the vote. Uh, these people that were getting elected were finding ways to make uh, the majority of the very rich and very powerful Romans uh, they were making them more wealthy, giving them riches, giving them food, throwing parties, and therefore being elected. A lot of the ideas from these kings came from uh, the Etruscan Empire, and they were ruling Rome with Etruscan ideals. Now, Rome was originally created to bring in everyone and include everyone, and that's how it was being run. So around 509, BC, Rome pushed back, uh, fought off the Etruscans, and created their own government. They wanted to be in charge. So Rome is free. Well, now what? Now they're not under the Etruscan rule anymore. Rome gets to create its own republic. So it was a kingdom. It was a it was considered a regal time uh, where kings were in charge. And let's be honest, once you were once you elected a king, you didn't have another say. You well, you elected a king. Now the king has complete control and complete power until the next election. In a republic, there was a lot more say, and the people had a say in Rome. Take a look at that picture behind my head here. It says SPQR. That stood for Senatus Populasque Romanus, which means the Senate and people of Rome. Roman uh, Romans were very proud of the fact that their people were helping govern their country. That's where the United States of America got a lot of its ideas. The people had a say, and the people could make a difference. So a republic is where the people elect representatives to serve and represent them on their behalf. Not just the rich, not just the most powerful, or the people with the most land, or the people with blue eyes, or the people with the, I, 15 horses, but all the people. Rome was tired of the monarchy making all the decisions, and those decisions didn't always help everyone in the country. So now Rome has a republic, and everyone can take part. Sound familiar? That's what we got. We got a republic. They wanted to safeguard their own rights, so one of the first things they did was write down the 12 tables. Now, what is the 12 tables? That was the set of laws that were the original first set of laws that the Roman Republic wrote down. Some of these laws are a little crazy, and they did get amended and changed over time. 
but they were 12 tables, which is actually not a table like you think of that you eat off of at dinner, but a table as in a tablet or a chunk of rock. And they carved those tablets, those chunks of rock, and they carved these laws into them. Now, some I'm going to read a couple of these laws because they're quite fun or quite interesting. Um, some of them did change, but these were the original laws, the original 12 tables. Uh, things like uh, they talked about going to trials, which were originally created by the Viking. Well, the Vikings did trials, but so did Rome. Um, like if anyone summons a man before a magistrate or a judge, he must go. If a man summoned does not go, uh, let him take him by force. So basically, if you needed to go to a trial because you had done something wrong and someone was calling you out for doing something wrong, so they were putting you in trial, you had to go. If you didn't show up, they could send police officers or you know the, 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 the guards, not really police officers at the time, but they could send their law enforcement to come get you. Hey, we follow that same rule here. If you're called to go to trial, you need to show up. Uh, he whose witness has failed to appear may summon him by loud calls before his house every third day. In other words, if you're being called as a witness in a trial, you have to show up. If you don't, the people who summoned you in the first place can show up at your house every third day and scream really loud for you to come out and go to trial uh, every third day. I think that that was a really funny one. Uh, it talks about uh, females' rights. Ladies, you didn't have a lot of rights in Rome. Females should remain in guardianship even after they have attained their majority, which means once ladies have come of legal adult age, someone still has to be in charge of you. Yeah. Girls didn't have a lot of rights in Rome, at least not initially. Uh, let them keep the road in order. If they have not paved it, a man may drive his team where'er he likes. Basically that's saying, if the road is not paved, you can drive your team of horses that's carrying your wagon anywhere you want because the government has to keep that road in order, much like our roads here. If that road is not paved, you can drive wherever you like. <laughs> Off-road. I like that plan. Uh, things like if you, uh, if one is slain while committing a theft, he is rightly slain. That's pretty strict, which means if you try to steal something from someone and you get injured or killed while you're trying to steal from someone, ah, that's too bad. You were trying to steal something. You were committing a bad act. So it made, uh, it made less people want to steal things from others. Uh, if a person who has been found guilty of giving false witness, they shall be hurled down from the Tarpeian Rock. Hey, we know that rock. This is sta stating that if, you, if you're lying, of being a false witness, if you say someone did something and they didn't do it, if you are lying, you will be thrown off of that rock. Yeah. If you're committing treason, you'll be thrown from the Tarpeian Rock. If you murder someone, uh, yet yeah, you're going to be thrown off the rock. And if you're lying, just for lying, and you're found guilty of lying, you will be thrown for, from Tarpeian Rock. Uh, marriages should not take place between plebeians and patricians. And if you're going, Mrs. Colley, I don't know what a plebeian is. Well, you're going to find out in this video. And finally, women shall not wail on account of a funeral, which means, ladies, you are not allowed to cry at funerals. It didn't say men couldn't cry, but ladies, apparently, we, we got to be tough. We're not allowed to cry at funerals, just so you know. So what else happened now that Rome was free? Well, they figured out who was going to have power. The power, although not given to everyone, it was given to a few, which is still better than one king. 
Rome split up the power of government into three groups. The magistrates, or the judges, the senate, and the consuls, which is very similar to how America has its government. America has the judicial branch, which is the judges, the executive branch, which would be the consuls, a president and a vice president, and the Senate and House of Representatives, or the legislative branch. Same system of government. Whoa, so let's learn about that, shall we? We have the system of government, but the hierarchy of the people in Rome. So we're going to be talking about all these different types of people. Uh, very top include, um, we're going to be talking about classes of people, so not just plebeians and patricians, but where they fit into the government and ruling system as well. So the plebeians are a lower class. We have the slaves and then at the bottom, and then the patricians and all the roles the patricians can hold. So we'll start at the very bottom and work our way up. Starting at the bottom, slaves. Romans had slaves. Uh, slaves were typically people that were captured in battles and wars. And then once they were captured, they were sent back to Rome to be sold. So if you were a high leading military, or a military commander from another army and you got captured, you might be sold off as a slave in Rome. Royalty and patricians could not live in luxury without their slaves. This is true. Royalty, patricians, you had huge villas, huge houses, lots of land, probably your own farm. You had lots of, of space. And, well, you didn't have time to be in charge of the government and do the farming and do the cooking and do the cleaning and make sure people were were entertained and have big parties, you needed lots of help. So therefore, they had lots of slaves. Once you were bought as a slave, you were a slave for life, unless you were freed by your owner. Yes, you could move and work your way up and work your way out of slavery. Different types of slaves went for different amounts of money. Uh, if you had a specific skill set, you went for a lot more money, and you also actually had a better chance of becoming free again. If you had uh, language capabilities, you knew different languages, you knew how to read and write in different languages, you had uh, the ability to um, have some, or if you had some leadership capabilities, or you were a military leader, or you had knew uh, any type of skill that you could teach or train to someone else, you were a very, very, very uh, special person and you typically didn't remain a slave for long because you would be, you would work your way out of that and possibly into a position that you'd be getting paid for. If a slave got married and had children, the children automatically became slaves as well, which was pretty sad. And you didn't have any rights. Uh, whatever your owners wanted, that's what you would do. You could work your way out, though, and become a plebeian. So there were two levels of plebeians. There were the ordinary townspeople plebeians and the tribunes. So the ordinary plebeians, we like to call them the plebes. Uh, farmers, lower, lower class workers, also a lot of soldiers were plebeians. If you were a tribune, you had a little bit of a, a step up from the regular plebeians. These are people that were voted on and you spent a year in your tribune position. You're typically military leaders, generals, someone who's worked your way up in the military, had a lot of uh, a lot of knowledge, a lot of intelligence, and you probably knew a lot of people because this position was voted on. Your job was to gather in assemblies and protect the rights of the plebeians. So you would take a lot of information from the plebeians. You would gather in these large assemblies and you'd say, hey, what rules what laws don't make sense? What rules do you think we need? What, you know, what do we need more of? Do we need more water? Do we need more food? Do we need more rights? Do we need, what do we need? And then you would take all those problems to the patrician assembly. And there you would be heard and say, hey, the plebeian class of this city, 
these are the problems that we're facing right now. This is where we need your help. And that's how your needs would get met. The next level, the patricians. So story of the patricians. Um, King Romulus during his rule uh, appointed 100 men to the ruling class of the city. And those ruling class were called the fathers or the patras of Rome. And the patras of Rome and all of their families were considered the ruling class from then on for all eternity for the Roman Empire, which meant if your great, 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 great grandfather was one of the Patras, it meant you were now a member of the patricians, of the fathers of the family, and you had full citizenship rights. Plebeians did not necessarily have full citizenship rights, and that was a pretty big deal because as a full citizen, if you were a male, you that meant you descended as one of the original members of Rome, one of those patras. As a full citizen, you were allowed to vote. You could marry whoever you wanted. You could hold public office. You had a lot more rights. Uh, as a partial citizen, which was what the plebeians were, if you were born in Rome, you were a partial citizen. And although you couldn't vote, unless you were a tribune, you couldn't hold office unless you were a tribune. Uh, you couldn't marry whoever you wanted. Uh, you could still own land. You could still run a business. But you didn't have all the rights that the full patricians had. Now, men born into the patrician class would always be patricians, no matter what. Men, you could marry a plebeian woman or a patrician woman. You would always, always, always remain a patrician. Women, you'd remain patricians unless you married outside your class. So ladies, if you found a really cute guy who was a plebeian and you really liked him, you probably still wouldn't marry him. Because if you did, you would leave your ruling class and all the riches you might have and you would become a plebeian and you would drop down to a lower class. Uh, and well, you might not like that. It happened, it surely did, because love conquers all. Yes, and love is the most important thing, but it didn't always, it wasn't always the most important thing for some people. Uh, men, although I wrote here, you were not allowed to marry lower than your current class, it happened quite a bit. And then people would just change backgrounds and change uh, histories of people to make the women uh, that they were marrying uh, appear that they had been part of the patrician class. So there were five levels of patricians. At the very, very, very top, you had the consuls. There were two, much like Pardon me. Much like the president and vice president in America, consuls. Then you had the Senate. There were about 300 of them. The judges or the praetors, magistrates, there were eight. The aediles, they looked after public buildings, uh, public community offerings, games, the food supply, the water supply. They were kind of like the public works people. And then the Coisters, who monitored financial and, and administrative duties. They were in charge of money and how much money was coming in, how much did the city have, and were people getting paid. So the consuls, there were two of them, and they ruled Rome. They were really the people in charge. They made all the final decisions. They consisted of past and current judges, and they served for life. They serve for life. So if you were a consul, you were a consul until one, you either died, or two, you stepped down and said, I can't do this anymore, I don't want this job. You could propose laws, which means you could say, hey, I have an idea for this, but you were not allowed to pass the laws. So a little bit different uh, than what we do in America, at, you could not, you know, our president, signs off on laws, executive order signs something. 
consoles couldn't do that. Consoles could say, I think it would be a great idea if. And they'd take that to the Senate, and it was up to uh, the Senate and the magistrates to make those decisions. The Senate, 300 men, not women, 300 men who were now pre who were previous judges at one point who now gave advice to the consuls and helped make uh, big group decisions about the direction of Rome. And then you had the praetors or magistrates, or another word for magistrates and praetors is judges. There were eight, and they administered the Roman law and signed laws into play. All right. Occasionally, during an emergency, such as war, there was a need for decisions to be made by one person. Consuls couldn't make one final decision. Like I said, they made, they made a lot of decisions, but they couldn't make official laws. Uh, and they couldn't direct the army exactly where to go all the time. The Senate had a lot to do with that. So sometimes there was a need to make decisions instantly by one person, and it needed to be fast, and let's go, there's, there's stuff going on. Kind of like if we had a pandemic, and you needed one person to make all the decisions, let's go, here we go, right now. Well, then in that case, a dictator was chosen. This person was chosen by the consuls, and this person was to rule and make all the choices, all of them. They had limited time in this power. Six months was the average that they were given. Uh, they typically weren't given more than that, and they typically didn't use that much time either. But six months was their term limit, and then more uh, the consuls would make a decision after that, uh, depending on if they needed to change their dictator or move away from it or so on. But all the power and all the decisions were made by one person until the problem was solved. Now this person might go to others to get ideas, to get advice, but they made every decision. Now, this need for a dictator could be a very bad thing or a very good thing in times of crisis. On the one hand, you might have someone who gets power hungry and uses all of the resources of Rome in their best interest and makes life very difficult for other people. On the other hand, you might have someone who just can be a fantastic leader and can know what to do and does it so well that they're, they're a pretty honorable person. The best example of a dictator in the history of the Roman Empire was Cincinnatus. Lucius Quintius Cincinnatus. That's a big name to say. He was a patrician and a military leader uh, and a statesman. He was a senator at one time. And when he retired from being a senator and from being in the military, he retired to his family farm. He lived most of his life you know, hand plowing the fields that he was working with his small family. And one day, uh, the northern borders of Rome were invaded and the Senate knew that this meant war, but they didn't know how to spur into action. So the consuls knew of the man that they trusted the most, Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus, and went to his farm and told him, you know, Cincinnatus, we need you to put your toga on and report to the Senate. And a toga, uh, as you've probably been seeing in all these pictures, is this big drapery of cloth that is meant to show status and power in Rome. And they asked him to report to the Senate, which was this huge assembly meeting area. And he could not report to the Senate without wearing his toga. So he retrieved his toga, arrived back in Rome. And when he was met at the Senate, they immediately pronounced him dictator, gave him the information and said, what do we do? This man was incredible. Most people would have said, we're being invaded and now I'm dictator and what? But Cincinnatus was calm, 
was ready for anything as being uh, from all of his years in the military, was ready for anything. He took the information. He made some decisions. He set up somewhat of a, a, not a draft, but sent word out to all of Rome and said, I need to see everyone who is available to fight at the Field of Mars, you know, God of War, Field of Mars, ready to go, the Campus Martius, uh, ready to go tomorrow, we're marching off to protect our borders. More people than expected showed up, they armored up, and they marched off to the northern border. Avengers Assemble, uh, it, was, it was an impressive feat, and he was organized, he was well respected, so people followed his orders immediately, and in one battle, in one day, took out the enemy, and then instead of having the entire opposing army killed, he held a compromise, they held a truce, uh, they took some, some money from the opposing side as a peace offering, the one army went one way, Rome's army came back, and 15 days, not six months, but 15 days after he was given the appointment of dictator, he stepped down from the Senate, said, Rome is safe again, and retired to his farm. 15 days, he stopped a war. Now there was a second appointment as well in the history books, uh, very similar, uh, another, uh, another uprising, the consul immediately came up with his name. He showed up. This uh, this problem took a little bit longer, took two months, about 54 days. And 54 days, the exact day, gave back his power and said, ah, you know, you're doing, Rome's doing good. Rome's in good hands. If you need me, I'll be in my farm. And the consuls and the Senate unanimously thought this guy was incredible. This military leader, this dictator, Cincinnatus was incredibly, incredibly honorable. He had great integrity. Uh, he held Roman virtue at its highest. And they offered him to be dictator for longer. And he turned it down. He refused. He said, Rome is not meant to be led by one man. And went back to his farm to retire and worked on his farm until the day he died. In honor of him, uh, New York has a city called Cincinnatus. Ohio has Cincinnati. And the Cincinnati Society was uh, created during the Civil War to honor those with integrity and virtue. That is, as I'm sad to say, the end of that presentation. I hope you learned a little bit about the Roman Republic now that we've got a republic started, we can move on to some more exciting things in Rome, such as how did they live? What did they eat? Where did they go? What did they do? And all the exciting things up next in your next episode of Roman History with Mrs. Colley. So see you later.